times, and his praise shall continually be in my mouth. My soul shall make her boast in the Lord. The humble shall hear thereof and be glad. Oh, magnify the Lord with me, and let us exalt his name together. I sought the Lord, and he heard me, and delivered me from all my fears. They looked upon him and were lightened, and their faces were not ashamed. This poor man cried, and the Lord heard him, and saved him out of all his troubles. The angel of the Lord encamped around about them that fear him, and delivered them. Oh, taste and see that the Lord is good. Blessed is the man that trusted in him. Amen?
that are here, all that are on social media. Uh, we welcome you here today. We just pray that uh, each and every one of you be blessed by the word. So once again, welcome to Mount Zion Missionary Baptist Church. Amen. Amen.
Oh,
Amen. Amen. So now we'll have our tithes and offerings. Uh, for those who are joining us online, you can go to the church website. There's a link there for you to give through Givelify. Uh, also, if the YouTube channel is up and working, there's a link in there for you to go uh, to Givelify. There's also a video up there to show you how to use, it, uh, use the app on your device if you want to do it that way. Good thing about Givelify, you don't have to worry about us being here. You can give anytime. Amen. 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 So for those of us who are here, the basket will uh, come along so that we can give, and then we'll have our catechism by Minister and Training Minor. Amen. 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 Let me pray. Father, we just thank you for this offering. We thank you, dear Lord, for blessing us and allowing us to give back a portion of what you've given us. I pray, dear Lord, that these uh, funds, dear Lord, will be used for the upkeep of your kingdom, dear Lord. I pray, Father God, for those who give, and especially pray for those who have a heart, but not the means. Father, it's in Jesus' name I pray and give thanks. Amen. 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 <laughs> baptized. 
And the Catechism answer is, the infants of believers are not to be baptized because there is neither command nor example in the Holy Scriptures, nor implication from them to baptize such. But baptism is made an expression of faith. And the scriptures are from Colossians 2.12, 1 Peter 3.21, Galatians 3.26 and 27. Amen? Amen? So the Catechism answer today tells us that the infants of believers are not to be baptized because there is neither command nor example in the Holy Scriptures nor implication from them to baptize such. But baptism is made an expression of faith. So the New Testament scriptures give evidence that those who give a believable and confident profession of faith can and should be baptized and should show reasonable evidence of believing in Jesus Christ. The Bible tells us that baptism is symbolic of Christ's death, burial, and resurrection. A symbol of our identification with Christ. So in other words, it is an expression of our belief in and identification with the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus Christ. It is a profession of our desire to be dead to a worldly, sinful life and to be raised to a new and Christ-like living. So Colossians 3 verses 1 through 4 says, Since then you have been raised with Christ, set your heart on things above, where Christ is seated at the right hand of God. Set your mind on things above, not on earthly things. For you died and your life is now hidden with Christ in God. When Christ, who is your life, appears, then you also will appear with him and glory. So the fact of the matter is, in order to show a true profession, profession of our faith in Christ and an experience of our desire to be like him, baptism must be the voluntary act of an intellectual person, not an infant. Amen. The individual must have a person per, must have a, a personal experience or have ex, uh, uh, experience of the realities or revelation of what they are seeking to identify with. The fact is there are many religions that practice infant baptism and also believe that it's a requirement for salvation. If baptism was a requirement for salvation, then John 3.16 would be irrelevant. Mm -hmm. There's much confusion about baptism in the various Christian denominations, but we must not get it twisted. It is not a result of the Bible, Bible giving a confusing message on baptism. The Bible is clear and true of what baptism is, who it is for, and what it accomplishes. The Bible says only believers who had placed their faith in Christ were baptized as a public testimony of their faith in Christ and identification with him, a commitment to submission to him, and identification with his death, burial, and resurrection. So that tells us that infants, an infant baptism is not a biblical practice. An infant cannot place his or her faith in Christ. An infant cannot make a conscious decision to obey Christ. An infant cannot understand what water baptism symbolizes. The Bible does not record any infants being baptized. As a matter of fact, the scriptures tell us that those who were baptized were those who gave a believable profession of their faith. Acts 2 verse 41 tells us that after Peter's sermon at Pentecost, those who received his word was baptized. It says, those who received his word, which tells us they also trusted in Christ for salvation. And also Acts, the eighth chapter, verse 12 tells us when Philip preached the gospel in Samaria, 
when they believed and, and he preached the good news of the kingdom of God and the name of Jesus Christ, they were baptized, both men and women. Likewise, in Acts chapter 10, Peter preached to the Gentiles in Cornelius' household, and they were baptized after hearing the word of God. In Acts chapter 16, the apostle Paul preached the word of God to Lydia and her household, and they were baptized also. The family of the Philippian jailer, after hearing the word and giving true evidence of their faith, they were baptized. Well, the point I want to make here is there were no scriptural evidence that any of these households baptized infants. But the whole household gave evidence of faith. In fact, that catechism of scripture, Paul says in Galatians 3.27, as many of you as were baptized into Christ have put on Christ. In other words, baptism is, is an outward sign of an inward faith or regeneration like that of being born again. So Paul would not be talking about infants because infants would not have come to saving faith or even any evidence of regeneration yet. A catechism of scripture, Colossians 2.12, gives us more evidence which says, you were buried with him in baptism in which you also were raised with him through faith in the working of God who raised him from the dead. So this could not be for instance since they were not yet old enough to understand faith for themselves. The reality is baptism does not save a person if you have not first trusted in, the, in Christ for salvation. Amen. Infant baptism does not fit for biblical definition, does not fit the biblical definition of baptism or the biblical method of baptism. But the good news is Jesus said in Luke 18, verses 16 and 17, Let the little children come to me, and do not hinder them. For to, for to such is the kingdom of God. And with this in mind, and with the attributes of God's grace and mercy and love, we can come to the conclusion that the Bible tells us that God would not condemn infants, and would usher them into heaven whether they are baptized or not, despite the differences over baptism. On the other hand, if Christian parents wish to dedicate their infants to Christ, then an infant dedication ceremony is totally appropriate. However, even if infants are dedicated to the Lord, when they grow up, they will still have to make a personal decision to believe in Jesus Christ in order to be saved. Proverbs 22, 6 says, Train up a child in the way he should, should go, and when he is old, he will not depart from it. The fact of the matter is, we cannot get too wrapped up in the dividing lines of infant baptism. They shall all be covered by the grace and mercy of God. May God bless you all. Amen. 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 I know these times are hard. These are times are challenging times for all of us. But we here at Mount Zion just want to encourage you today to continue to sing the praises to the King. For he is the King of kings and the Lord of lords. Amen. Amen. Amen.
Now we know that he reigns forever. Because he reigns forever, we know that the good news is that trouble, the trouble that we're in right now, don't last always. It's only for a season. Come on, do y'all believe that choir? Yes. That trouble don't last always.
contact them directly. Uh, so we have some space next door. It's about 656 square feet for anyone who's interested. Our band went to the shop this week to get painted. Amen. 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 Get all the rust and stuff taken care of. <laughs> and uh, I think you'll be pleased once we get it back. Amen. 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 Uh, as you probably know by now, the Inspirational Choir will not be going to uh, Pilgrim uh, Baptist Church in uh, Locust Grove. That service has been postponed. Uh, we will let you know uh, when they reschedule that event so that you can attend if you are able. And then last, well, maybe not lastly, uh, the Sunday School Union. I'm still not sure what they're doing with that. I'm sure uh, Deaconess McDuffie will let me know and then I will let everyone else know whether or not they're still doing that next week. If they are still doing it next week, it is at First Asheville. Uh, Baptist Church, uh, Sunday schools at 10 o'clock, 11 o'clock morning session, and then 2 p.m. for the afternoon session. Uh, we're supposed to have a dress down service next week because it is fifth Sunday. If we have service, there will not be a potluck. Amen. I know that was already on the agenda to do, but we will not have the potluck. We will just have the dress down service. And I will let you know by Friday. So you don't have to call the deacons or the deaconess or the trustees to know whether or not we're going to have service. I will let you know by Friday whether or not we're having service, and I'll do it the same way that I did it the other night. You'll get a text message, an email, you know, and a voicemail message if we have all three of those forms of communication in the software for you. Amen? Yeah. And 
for the uh, church leadership. You know, remember our next uh, leadership uh, workshop is April 18th. April 18th from 10 a.m. to 12 p.m. Please mark your calendar. And then the usher convention, preferably by July, this will no longer be an issue. Uh, they're going down to the uh, national convention in Orlando, July 25th through August 1st. And they are looking for some assistance financially uh, to help uh, offset the cost of the hotel and the conference fees for the adults and the youth who are going. So if you're able to do that, when you're building Givelify, there's actually an envelope you know, that you can select in, in order to give to that cause. Amen. Before we uh, get into uh, our prayer, uh, a couple other announcements. Uh, one is I was contacted by some other pastors in the area, a part of the Warrington Gospel Partnership. There is a semi coming to this area that is loaded uh, with uh, toilet paper and water and, and, and those types of things. Uh, but it's also loaded with some little food packets. And within those food packets, there are it's enough food in there to serve a small family breakfast and dinner for a day. And it only costs 30 cents for that food packet. So the church is going to buy uh, 1,000 of those packets. But we're putting it out there for those who are physically able. If you're able to purchase some of those packets for yourself, and let me be clear, you're not purchasing them for yourself. We're purchasing these so that we can give them out to the community in the event that this thing lasts longer uh, than people's food supply so that we can provide them uh, with food later on down the road. So if you're able, you can contact me and I can give you more information. I'll give the trustees and actually they have as much information as I have. Or you can contact the trustees and we can give you more information on how you can uh, be able to purchase some of those packets. Amen? Amen. Amen. So let's pray. Father, we thank you for your grace and your mercy. We thank you, dear Lord. Uh, for those who are here, dear Lord, and those who could not make it. And a lot of us are shut in, dear Lord. We may not be sick, uh, but a lot are shut in because of what's going on. But we pray, Father God, that during their shut-in time, Father God, that they're still staying connected to you, that we're still in the midst of our devotional uh, period, Father God, as we are marching toward Resurrection Sunday. I pray, dear Lord, that people are staying consistent with that. I lift up, dear Lord, those who have been on our sick and shut-in list for a while now, dear Lord. Uh, and would not have been here uh, regardless of the circumstances. We lift them up to you still, uh, Father God, that you would continue to visit them where they are. We know it's hard for other people to get in to the nursing homes and the hospitals, uh, but we pray, Father God, that they would feel your presence no matter where they find themselves. And Father, as we open up the word here, dear Lord, I pray, uh, Father God, that something will be said, something, uh, dear Lord, will be heard, uh, dear Lord, that would give people confidence in and give them hope, Father God, and most importantly, that they would hear the gospel message and respond to it. Father, it's in Jesus' name, I pray and give thanks. Amen. 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 And so, if you have your Bibles with you here, if you're online, uh, it's Matthew chapter 20. Matthew chapter 20. When we get to Matthew chapter 20, we'll be starting at the 17th verse. So, Matthew chapter 20 beginning with the 17th verse. Matthew chapter 20, beginning with the 17th verse. If you're at home, you don't necessarily have to stand for the reading of the word, but I ask for those who are here, um, if you're physically able, that you would stand for the reading of God's word. Matthew chapter 20, beginning with verse number 17. If you have to say amen. Amen. Need a little more time? Say, wait a minute. All right. In the English Standard Version, it reads as follows. And as Jesus was going up to Jerusalem, he took the twelve disciples aside. And on the way, he said to them, See, we are going up to Jerusalem, and the Son of Man will be delivered over to the chief priests and the scribes, and they will condemn him to death, and deliver him over to the Gentiles to be mocked and flogged and crucified, and he will be raised on the third day. Then the mother of the sons of Zebedee came up to him with her sons, and kneeling before him, she asked him for something. And he said to her, what do you want? And she said to him, say that these two sons of mine are to sit, one at your right hand and one at your left, in your kingdom. Jesus answered, you do not know what you're asking. Are you able to drink the cup that I am to drink? They said to him, we are able. He said to them, you will drink my cup, but, not, but to sit at my right hand and my left is not mine to grant. 
but it is for those whom it has been prepared by my father. And when the ten heard it, they were indignant at the two brothers. But Jesus called them to him and said, you know that the rulers of the Gentiles lord it over them, and their great ones exercise authority over them. It shall not be so among you, but, who's, but whoever would be great among you must be your servant, and whoever would be first among you must be your slave, even as the Son of Man came not to be served, but to serve, and to give his life as a ransom for many. And as they went out of Jericho, a great crowd followed him. And behold, there were two blind men sitting by the roadside, and they heard that Jesus was passing by. They cried out, Lord, have mercy on us, son of David. The crowd rebuked them, telling them to be silent, but they cried out all the more, Lord, have mercy on us, son of David. And stopping, Jesus called them and said, What do you want me to do for you? And they said to him, Lord, let our eyes be open. And Jesus, in pity, touched their eyes, and immediately they recovered their sight and followed him. The word of God for the people of God. And so we see in our, our text here this morning that for the third time, Jesus is letting his disciples know that at some point after they enter into Jerusalem, he is going to die. He is going, he is going to be turned over uh, to the, the leadership there, and he is going to die. And the first time, if you remember, when Jesus tells them that he was going to die, Peter rebuked him and said, oh, it won't be so, Father, as long as I'm around, they ain't going to put a hand on you. And then that's when Jesus said, get thee behind me, Satan. And, uh, not that he was calling Peter Satan, but just like Satan, Peter was trying to, to deter or to move Jesus off the, the path that he had to take. And the second time that, that Jesus let them know that he was going to die uh, was right before he performed the miracle to pay the temple tax. So this is the third time that he tells them that. And then on the heels of him telling them that he is going to die, here comes the mother of the sons of Zebedee. Now, the sons of Zebedee are James and John. They are brothers who are also known as the sons of thunder. And they came from a more well-to-do family than the rest of the disciples. So they, they were some uppity Jews, amen? And, and so, so the mother comes to Jesus and she says, hey, I, I want to ask you something. And he says, you know, okay, so what is it that you want? He says, can you make my sons greatest in the kingdom? Put the one at the, the, the left hand and one at the right hand. And, 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 and I thought that was kind of strange when I first read this even many years ago. And even when I started, you know, rediscovering this text for this message here, I thought it was strange that a woman would come and ask Jesus for anything especially given the social uh, climate of that time. But as I began to study it, it was actually more likely that she would get a response for her son than if her husband came and, and asked Jesus for the same thing. And so the mother of James and John is thought to be Salome, who is the sister of Mary, which would make James and John actually Jesus' cousins. And so the, the, their more well-to-do status and perhaps their relationship with Jesus had given them more of uh, a uh, 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 gumption to come and ask to be sitting at the left hand and the right hand, more so than the other disciples that were following Jesus. And so Jesus doesn't respond to the mother. He responds to James and John. He says, look. Are you really? No, actually, I mean, in the way that he says it, right? The way he says, like, you really brought your mama into this? Right? You had to go run into your mama to try to get her to ask me something. That, that's kind of the tone that he has there, right? But he, but, but he asked them, you know, do you really understand what you're asking? Right? To, to put it in the words of, of, of Chris Tucker, do you really understand the words that are coming out of your mouth? That's right. Do you understand what you're asking? And they're like, yeah, Jesus, we get it. We, we can handle the cup, right? We can handle it. And Jesus said, okay, well, you're right. You are going to have to handle it, right? You are going to have to drink my cup. But here's the thing. Drinking of my cup is not enough to get you sitting on the left hand and the right hand. And, and for those who don't know, the cup signifies suffering or it, it signifies, uh, uh, you know, sometimes even in the Old Testament, it, it signifies wrath and, and retribution. And, and even punishment. And so Jesus, as we see later, when he's in the Garden of Gethsemane, he prays like, look, if this cup can pass from me, right? He knew what he was headed for, but he said, but nevertheless, not my will, but thy will be done. 
And so they, they, they're going to drink from the same cup. They just don't know it yet. And as we follow them along their lives, James will be the first of the disciples who are martyred for following Christ. And then we know that John spent some time on the Isle of Patmos being separated and persecuted for his faith. And then Jesus keeps going and he tells them, only my father can assign those seats and only for those he has prepared. And then the other 10, and this includes Judas, which is kind of funny to me, that they weren't none too happy about these two disciples coming up trying to get, you know, honored positions in the kingdom. Now, they, 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 these uppity Jews, looking, trying to get some privilege. We know how it is when people got a little bit of title, a little bit of influence. They always try to get a little bit more, trying to get a step up on other folk. Amen. Amen. Right. Amen. And so Jesus, he had recently responded uh, 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 about their discussion about who would be the greatest in the kingdom, right? We saw that, that part of that discussion, he also went and, and the rich young ruler came and he, and he rebuked him and he told him, you know, it'd be harder for a rich person to get into heaven than, 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 uh, than it'd be hard for a rich person to make it into heaven. It's easier for a camel to go through the eye of evil. That's what I'm really trying to say there. Than for a rich man to make it into heaven. And then he tells them about them, you know, being humble and things like that. And, and then he has the, the parable of the vineyard, you know, talking about who would be first there. And then here they come, talking about we want to be the greatest. Well, at least their mama's come talking about here, they're, they want to be the greatest. And so, of course, the other ten is like, you didn't learn nothing. You didn't learn nothing and all of that. And then Jesus responds, he said, look at how the Gentiles act. The rulers lord over the people using their authority and wealth as a weapon against them. But then he says, but that's not kingdom living. Greatness comes through serving. And you guys keep bringing up this greatness thing. But to be great, you must first be a slave. And not just any slave. And not just to anyone. You must be a slave. To your brother and we can expand and say your sister and that's totally opposite of what James and John were seeking they were asking to be placed in seats of greatness and Jesus says well you make yourself eligible for those seats by making yourself the least among your brothers doesn't mean that you won't get those seats but unless you become a slave you're not even eligible for those seats and then Jesus concludes by saying Look, look at me, I'm your example. If anyone deserves to be seen as, as great, you know, it would be Jesus. Think about all the healings that he performed. All the deliverance that he did. The raising people from the dead. If anyone thought to be great, it would be him. But he didn't pull on that. Right? All those things that he did wasn't even for him. He did those things in service for other people. And he did it most of the time at personal risk to himself. Now remember the only miracle that Jesus performed that remotely looks like he did it for, for his own benefit was the payment of the temple tax. He says, I didn't come to be served. Jesus said, I come to serve, but not just to serve and to give my life as ransom for many. Now ransom is a sum of money or another payment demanded for or paid for the release of a prisoner. And he didn't do this for everyone. I know you're looking at me saying, well, yes, he did. No, he didn't. That's not what the text said. The text said that he did it for many. It didn't say he did it for everyone. Right? And the only reason, it really, the only way that it would apply to you is if you accept what he did on the cross. Amen. And then he goes on and he performs a healing, you know, at the end. And we're not going to spend a lot of time here. Primarily, our focus today is going to be on the conversation between Jesus, uh, James and John's uh, mother, and then the disciples themselves. So there's your text for the day. Right. The, the plug in sheet it will be online. It, it's not up there right now. But to, as just join with me for a few moments, we should still be done by 12 o'clock. Amen. Just because there ain't a whole lot of people here that give me license and you just keep on babbling on. All right? We want to preach today from the subject, kingdom greatness. Kingdom greatness. Many people want to be 
or do something great. If we look at the life of the late Kobe Bryant, his drive and his passion came from his desire to be the greatest, but not just in basketball. He wanted to be the greatest in everything that he did. Even when it comes down to being evil, people want to do it in a grand or great way. Amen? Because I, 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 I struggle with the logic of people who commit crimes and then they put it on Facebook Live. Right? But it's because they want to do it in a grand way. Amen? Now, say it another way. Folks just like to be large and in charge. I know that's old vernacular, amen, but it's in my generation. They, they like to, to, to have not just the last say, but they want to have the only say. They, they have the same motto as AT&T. Okay is not okay. They seem to have to do extra in order to ensure that they stand out from everyone else. Now, don't get me wrong, there's nothing wrong with pursuing greatness, but many times with our definition of greatness being flawed, our pursuit of that greatness is also flawed. Now, we will step on other folks to make it to the top. We'll pull down other folks as we climb the corporate ladder. And when we see greatness as, as better than or larger than or smarter than or in, in any other way overshadowing others, we have a flawed definition of greatness. And this is the message that Jesus has for his disciples and for us here today. See, the mother of James and John, she actually gives us our first point for today. Kingdom greatness is not something you can ask for. That's your point. It's not something you can ask for. James and John, through their mama, they're asked a question that focuses on their glory and not the cross. The question she asks is a selfish question and is somewhat of a replay of what we saw back in chapter 18. It would seem that they didn't learn anything from the encounter with the rich young ruler. That they didn't learn anything uh, from Jesus' response to the rich young ruler or the parable of the workers in the vineyard. But here's something we may miss in her coming to ask this question. Yes, the question was a selfish question, but it's a question of one who is a believer. The question was asked about sitting on the left and the right of the throne, amen? So they were sold out on Jesus being king. They just had the wrong kingdom. They were still rolling with an earthly mindset or an earthly kingdom mindset. And I believe that we have some folks in church just like that today. They are seeking kingdom greatness from an earthly perspective and not a true kingdom perspective. They believe that if they do churchy things, then... They'll make it, that'll make them great in heaven. If they carry a title or, uh, you know, that will make them great in heaven. If they, they outgive or outsing or outpray or outdo more in ministry than other people in the church, that will somehow make them great in the kingdom. And many times they want the position of being up front, but not the accountability of being up front. See, to have the great power is to also hold the great responsibility that comes with it. That's right. See, to ask for a high position is to ask for the weight of responsibility and hard decisions that come with the position. It is to ask for great labor, perhaps even great suffering that comes along with the position. To ask to be the center of attention means that you really want to be the center of attention, whether it's good or it's bad. See, and that may seem to be attractive, but, but it also means that every word and deed brings about a kind of scrutiny that you may not deserve and may not be able to bear. And above all, to share in Christ's glory, one must share in his suffering. So if you want to be great, then you need to be, need to be prepared to suffer. Right? Because there's no glory in the kingdom without the cross. See, you can't ask for kingdom greatness. And so the mother of James and John asked about the position of her sons, but Jesus responds to the sons. You have no idea what you're asking for. Are you really able to drink the cup that I'm about to drink? And they answer in the affirmative, and Jesus tells them, yes, you will drink from my cup. They weren't going to drink from it right away, but they were going to drink from the cup of suffering and death for their allegiance to Jesus. See, kingdom greatness it's not something that you can ask for. But here's your next point. 
Kingdom greatness is something you have to be prepared for. Your point is something you have to be prepared for. Jesus never promised us a rose garden. Matter of fact, he assured us of persecution for following him. Jesus had warned these brothers three times death was in the not so distant future and they appeared to be willing to drink from that cup. And many times in our day and age, people don't really count the cause nor are they willing to put in the time to be prepared to drink from that cup. See, because people don't count the cost and, uh, to, prepare, uh, to be prepared to drink from that cup, when challenges come from the enemy, they compromise in order to preserve themselves instead of staying fast or being steadfast and enduring the persecution. See, but in preparation for the kingdom, in preparation for kingdom greatness, you must be willing to obey and submit yourself to the Lord. You must be prepared to endure hardship and stand in the face of opposition. You must, be real, you must be ready to see and have revealed the ugliness of your sin. You must be ready to know that the world is not going to like you. Be willing to step outside of your comfort zone. Be prepared to be held accountable. To take God at his word. To leave some things and some people behind. You need, to be, you need to expect to be humble and be prepared to love. Amen. Even those people who aren't lovable. Right. See, you, you just can't get kingdom greatness. You have to be prepared for it. And you prepare for how you live your life. So kingdom greatness is not something you can ask for. It's not something, or excuse me, it's something you have to be prepared for. And lastly, kingdom greatness is something you have to die for. Kingdom greatness is something you have to die for. Jesus says, even as the Son of Man came, not to be served, but to serve and to give his life as a ransom for men. Jesus came to die. The devil tried to get him to, to sidestep his death. Peter suggested death would not come to Jesus. And Jesus prayed to see if there was any other way than the cup of death that he had to taste. Jesus had to die in order for us to obtain kingdom greatness. And if we want kingdom greatness, guess what? We have to die also. And of course, this means we have to die spiritually. If we are not dying to ourselves on a daily basis, they will never achieve kingdom greatness. It is the dying to self that allows us to be slaves to our brothers and sisters in Christ. See, when you suck on yourself, mm -hmm. it, makes you, it makes it hard for you to serve other folk. Right. See, see, some folk come to church so they can be served. They want to see what people are. Oh, I need for you to pray for me. Oh, how much can I get from the church? Well, you can get a Coke and a smile sometimes, amen? But you ain't always going to get something to church. You should have a mindset when you come to church that I'm going to give to somebody else. Don't you got a prayer in your heart that you can give to somebody else? Don't you have a handshake or a hug that you can give to somebody else? Just let them know that I understand that you're going through something and everything is going to be all right. Ain't you got something to give when you come to church? Amen. You can't just come here and get Amen. That's a selfish request without understanding the kingdom. See, we allow ourselves to live in, uh, excuse me, when we allow ourselves to live in God's will for our lives, not the will of ourselves, then we'll start making strides to being prepared for the kingdom. It's not about having position. It's not about having power in the church. It's not about you know, having our titles. None of that stuff matters. When it comes to being great in the kingdom. Amen. I can't imagine that our titles are going to mean much when we get to heaven. Right. I can't imagine it's going to mean much. You know, as, as impressive as our titles might, might be, is it more impressive than the father of Israel? Is it more impressive than, than being the apostles? You know, they, they had titles, amen? They had, a, they had titles given to them by God. We got titles we give ourselves, amen? Right. No matter how impressive your resume may be, 
How does it compare with any of the New Testament writers? As great as people think that you are, as a, a pontificator of the gospel, amen, because you know we a preacher get big heads sometimes, because folks pat us on the back about how well we do when we preach a message, amen. How does that compare to the great cloud of witnesses that we see in Hebrews chapter 11? If we want to be great in the kingdom, it can't be about who we are. It must be about whose we are. It's not about making us great. Amen. I, 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 I get what the slogan is in, in, in this environment. Amen. It ain't about making America great. It's about making Jesus great. Amen. And the only way to make Jesus great is to make him the center of our lives. If he's not the center of our lives, then he's not great in our lives. And if he's not great, then we have no chance of being greatest in the kingdom. Amen. Because we won't do the things necessary to be great. Let us pray. Father, we just thank you, dear Lord, for coming and dying for our sins. You wrapped yourself up in flesh. And we're so thankful, Father God, that you came and you paid a price that none of us could pay. I pray, Father God, that as this message has gone forth, there may be someone other than sound in my voice who's never received Jesus Christ as their personal Lord and Savior. And we want to give them that opportunity here right now. They don't have to be in a church building to get saved. What they really need to do is acknowledge that they are a sinner. And that the price for their sin is greater than anything that they could pay. And Jesus came and he paid that price for them. And so all they have to do is accept Jesus as the payment for their sins. Allow him to become their Savior and their Lord. That they would begin to live a life for him. Not for themselves and not for anyone else. And Father, there may be someone in the sound of my voice who may be looking for a church home and they live in the, the Warrenton, Virginia area. It's something that's accessible to them. We ask that they would consider Mount Zion as their church home. We don't claim to be a perfect church, but we are being perfected by the work of the Holy Spirit. And Father God, the third cause for those individuals who are saved may or may not have a church home, but they know that their life is no longer lining up with the will and the way of the Father. So I pray, Father God, that as they have been pricked in their spirit to rededicate themselves to you, that you would send people into their lives, Father, that would help them with the decision that they made for you here today. And then, Father God, there may be some other the sound of my voice who stand in need of prayer or want to stand in the gap for someone else. Right now, right where they are, Father God, you know the petitions of their heart. You know, dear Lord, what they stand in need of and those people that they're standing in the gap for. I pray, Father God, that it goes from your heart, through your Holy Spirit, to your ears, Father God. Knowing, Father, that you are the only one who can really do anything about the situation and the circumstances that they're praying for. And Father God, I just want to thank you once again, dear Lord, uh, for this choir and this, this musician, dear Lord, and all those who come here today, dear Lord, to make this online experience happen. And Father God, if we need to do it again next week, I pray, dear Lord, that you would help us correct the things that are a little rough today, Father God. That we would represent you well. Father, we love you and we praise you. Fathers, in Jesus' name, we pray and give thanks. Amen. Amen. I'd like to thank Christian for coming out on the keyboards. I'd like to thank Christian for coming out being on the drums. Amen. For this fire, amen. For minister and training, still moving forward with his training. Until God allows us to be together again. Be calm, be blessed, and wash your hands, amen. God bless you. Have a smile upon you.